Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson. Today is Wednesday, January 16th, 2019. Um, I um, require donations to remain on the air. I require donations to have a roof over my head. I have tax problems that, uh, among many other things, that have come in post-divorce tax-related issues. And these guys are after me. I know there's a lot of very good places, you know, to send your donation money. But my independence, my complete lack of, of, I don't have to worry about what anyone wants of me. I am completely free, which is a great gift. And I thank you for it. But it only comes to the extent my listeners support me. It's not easy for me to ask for money. I, I, I'm not used to it, but over the last few years, I've had no choice. Most of my stuff is available for free, and I'm happy to do it. But once in a while, I do need to eat. I thank you very much for your support. And one of the things that I can do, being a completely independent scholar, and historian, and philosopher, of course, I have my doctoral degree is in more than one field, um, political science and, and philosophy to be, to be exact, uh, from the same university. Uh, we're going to talk about something that people on our side have hardly ever mentioned. And I'm bringing it up because, um, Zaire Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro, sorry, of Brazil has brought it up. Um, and that is the Latin American legacy of, um, military governments during the Cold War anti-communist military governments during the Cold War. I've covered this in certain areas in South Korea and in Indonesia. Um, and now I'm going to do it in Latin America. Now, this may be a two-part episode because I am looking at a paper that I am I'm pretty much finished with. It's 34 single-space pages. And um, I'm probably not going to get through it all. And of course... No matter how much I write, you know, there's so many of these guys. Um, you know, Juan Peron alone could, you know, last forever. So um, I have to be careful what I mention and what I don't for the sake of time. But one of the things that uh, Bolsonaro has said is being, in, being in a, a, a former officer himself, that he does admire uh, the military government of Brazil and the withering Media criticism for it has been absolutely, well, it's, it's, it's Trumpian. Uh, but of course he's right. Without exception. You know, Bolsonaro, I know, I know some people down there, um, who are not particularly happy with him. He is, he does believe in global free trade. He is selling off the ports to the highest bidder that the military nationalized some years ago, some decades ago. Every newspaper calls him a, far-right fringe figure, every major outlet, without any exception, proving that, of course, they coordinate the report, and like they do in every major issue. The Washington Post calls him a hard-right nationalist who rode a wave of rage to the presidency, and yet he advocates for complete global free trade. This means that the Post is either unaware of what nationalism is, and or using the term to frighten its rapidly dwindling readership. He demonized opponents and polarized the nation with its history of denigrating women, gays, and minorities. Well, they were short on specifics. But then right underneath it, the Post also ran an article called How Bolsonaro Entranced Brazil's Minorities While Also Insulting Them. Well, something's not quite right here. Black voters, actually, were a key part of his election victory. Like all of Latin America since World War II, liberal democracy has led to the utter destruction, the, the hollowing out of Latin America. Under Brazil's leftist banana republic, um, 2018 saw the murder of almost 70,000 people. This is why he got the black vote. The Post says that his tough-on-crime approach, like he has a choice in the matter, will fall on poor areas that are mostly black. So they argue that while blacks love him because he promised to kill the drug dealers, they really hate him, we're told, 
because most of these drug dealers are black. Hence the title of the article, um, How Bolsonaro Entranced Brazil's Minorities While Also Insulting Them. This is the level of logic in, in journalism today. The topic today comes to some extent from this. For many, many years, I've talked about what are called authoritarian governments, and showing how, with very few exceptions in the third world, they've done very, very well. They've done far better uh, in every respect than liberal democracies have. More specifically, though, it's a common claim in these matters that the United States supported brutal militarist governments in Latin America in the 20th century because they were anti-communist. And it's repeated so often that no one, not even conservatives, will challenge it. Well, as always, like all this kind of proverbial wisdom, it's false. There's absolutely no reason to believe these military governments were brutal in the context of the civil wars and guerrilla insurgencies that they faced. But more importantly, they came into existence in the first place because weak democracies failed to deal the disintegration of the continent. But we're dealing with a situation where both academics and journalists are hanging on to jobs. You know, those kind of full-time jobs are disappearing in both fields. They're very easy, very privileged jobs. And they're both leftist activist centers. So if they want to maintain their position increasingly, as budgets get tighter, you know, the newspaper readership is way down, they need to conform. And this kind of conformity, whether it's their own personal uh, commitment or their professional uh, the requirement for them to pro- function professionally, their, their their perception and their reason is, is, is very much distorted. Well, the third world is a, a closed book to Americans. What little they know is, is poorly, is, is, a, is a poorly reasoned set of myths. Military governments in Latin America engaged in the most far-reaching land reform programs possible at the time. Democratically elected governments did not do that and could not do that. Whether it be the Middle East, Asia, Europe, Latin America, soldiers are usually from the peasant classes. And since they're in the army, they have their own sources of funding. Because of that, because they don't need to run campaigns and get media attention, they can go over the heads of the rich. They're not from that clan. But if you're a politician... You have to court these wealthy people, including foreign wealthy people. Politicians don't have independent sources of funding. The truth is, of course, that the U.S. opposed military governments throughout Latin America. Instead, they promoted non-communist, but liberal, parties and movements. It was no different in El Salvador, Cuba, anywhere where military governments ruled during the Cold War. These governments came into existence the 11th hour to stop their society's descent into madness. And many have, you know, well-thought-out ideologies that no one knows anything about. And like so many third-world nationalists, it's one of the reasons I got into this in the first place many, many years ago, they're national socialists. Not necessarily in the Hitlerian sense of the term, but very broadly, they're national socialists. They, they, They fight for a strong state, that can oversee a growing economy while trying to ensure uh, a fair distribution of resources and plan the economy under the harshest of circumstances. Now, of course, in communist countries, the plan is based around the fact that the party owns everything, which means the party leadership owns everything. Remember, Leon Trotsky died worth maybe $3 billion dollars. So much for communism. In places like South Korea or um, Peru, for example, the state had a certain controlling interest, but not necessarily an ownership interest in capital. But in, in Latin America, civil war, outdated transportation systems, poor infrastructure, drug issues, foreign pressure, and budgetary disasters would make even the best intention ruler willing to do pretty much anything to save the country unless 
he's being rewarded to maintain its condition. But of course, none of this is taken into account by the academic or journalist class. Some of the more absurd claims, and this is, this is probably the most absurd of them all, uh, talking of, uh, speaking of anti-communist movements in Latin America, an absolute fool named John Henry Coatsworth. He says, the number of victims in Latin America alone far surpassed that of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc during the period 1960-1990. This man is, is a provost of Columbia University. Now, what he's trying to say here is that he thinks that desalinization, which is mythology to begin with, meant that the gulags were dismantled. People really think this. Well, the percentage of the Soviet economy dependent on slave labor actually increased in that period of time. Khrushchev was not, was close to Stalin. He wasn't anti-Stalin at any time. He was no different from Stalin, Lenin, or Trotsky. He just had a better PR department and a far more advanced state apparatus. Soviet gulag population in this period is several million at least, about 30 million in China, and of course we know about Cambodia, a client of China. But to ignore these facts is to destroy scholarship. But that's the stupidity that you have to deal with here, and that even conservatives are willing to accept. Operation Condor is often cited as evidence although most of this evidence is is circumstantial and the numbers are grossly inflated. But, you know, it's really silly to even talk about this because these countries were all in the midst of civil wars. Remember, at the time uh, this is going on, Pol Pot is in power, Mao Zedong is in power. This is what they had to lose if they lost. Now, allegedly... Operation Condor is some CIA DOD plot to fight Marxism in Latin America. And they claim that the number killed of innocent people, I don't know how they know they're innocent or not. I have no idea whether they're combatants or not. Is more than 60,000. Which is supposed to make me upset. That's a weekend for Lenin. The truth is, is that of course, like everything these people believe, Operation Condor was not American, it was a creation of the militaries of the area to assist one another in fighting Marxism and drug trafficking. The left had the cocaine dealers, Cuba, the Soviet Union, the American media. The anti-communist movement needed their own international. This became, in the eyes of leftist professors and journalists, a sinister set of operations. Sounds like they come from a James Bond film, because they do. And so they, they use these Operation Condor, Operation Camelot, stuff like this, it taps into the popular conception of an intelligence uh, network, this ominous presence of such powers the public knows nothing anything about, knows nothing about. And so these guys can write about this confident that without any contra- countervailing information, they could spin the tale of supporting death squads and other Hollywood PR slogans. Well, of course, they're going to assume that no one's actually going to read the DOD and CIA documents that have been declassified concerning Operation Condor. And as I've done before uh, in my talk on Indonesia, where I've actually been through the CIA documents there, where they say nothing. They do not support him. They do not support the killing of anybody. Uh, absolutely not. In fact, they condemn the killing of communists there. But, I mean, how many people are going to go read the CIA documents? Well, I'm looking at the Memorandum of Conversation in Chile, dated June 6, 1976. Conversation between Undersecretary Rogers and Foreign Minister um, Guzzetti of Argentina. This is supposed to be one of the main proof texts, and yet it doesn't mention anything about the operation. And the only thing it mentions is their concern for the effects of terrorism on American citizens living in Chile. Marxism isn't mentioned at all. Marxism is rarely mentioned in, even in other documents, except when they're analyzing the, the purpose of the military governments themselves. There's another State Department uh, document called the um, the Third World War in Latin America from August 3rd, 1976. It does mention Operation Condor. But of course, this again, this was a classified document, not meant for public eyes. said they know nothing about it. But it also says that the militaries down there are paranoid about Marxist subversion. 
It condemns the military in these areas for bloody counterterrorism that threatens to increase their isolation from the West. I think by the West, I mean they're in the West. I think by the West, they mean the U.S. Condors is not said to be an American operation. In contrast to what the propagandists believe, these documents condemn military governments. And on page six, it actually says they're veering into national socialism. Well, it does make the empirically verifiable claim that these military governments have helped these countries substantially, but human rights issues remain a problem. They even make fun of the military of Paraguay, saying that it's a 19th century military regime that looks good on a cartoon page, which is on page 9. Ultimately, they say that a local anti-communist bloc is more trouble than it's worth. Page 11 and 12. Here's one more. Uh, Defense Department, October 1st, 1976. It actually worries that the militaries of the area aren't sharing anything with the U.S., proving the U.S. had nothing to do with any of this stuff. None of these governments were American-backed. They were condemned by the U.S. It never mentions Marxism, and the only thing it mentions is an anti-terrorist operation that these um, military governments down there were, were engaging. Like every other document that they, they, they try to promote in the, in the collection of Operation Condor, it attacks the military governments at one level or another, and condemns their so-called human rights record. So they, they come up with these things, Operation Condor. It's a, it's a myth of the of the American left. The internal documents, and there's many more, um, uh, they don't say what we're told that they do, but no one's actually going to read these things. The U.S. demanded the creation of liberal governments once terrorism's been stamped out, and to bring, and to bring these governments into U.S. orbit, meaning that their counterinsurgency tactics should uh, be moderated and American capital be let back in. The U.S. was completely kept in the dark about what Condor was, and frankly, it wasn't Washington's business. The U.S. was not supporting these governments. In fact, they were condemning them. So the sole concern of the U.S. was fighting terrorism. Military governments in Latin America existed to stop the country's slide into anarchy and economic depression. People weren't randomly killed. The, if you read the Wikipedia article, and it cites a lot of the major literature in the field, it's an absolute disgrace. It, it's nothing but propaganda. It doesn't even pretend to be descriptive. Anyone who uses a phrase like death squad shows their bias. A death squad exists in every war. It's called an army. There were civil wars, both on an ideological foundation and the drug dealers, and of course the communist movement being financed by the drugs. In most places, Argentina and Peru, definitely. They claim that these military governments were being supported, they never define what support means, by the U.S. or the CIA or something equally ominous and vague. The policies of the U.S. aren't secret. Pinochet in the 1970s was not allowed to enter the U.S. Somoza Nicaragua was condemned. His re-election bid was condemned by the President and the Kong. The Americans abandoned Batista early in the Cuban Civil War and Chiang Kai-shek and, and Taiwan as well. People don't realize that Batista was the communist candidate for president in 1940 in Cuba. Everyone knows Bacardi run, right? Well, the Bacardi family backed Castro. Many of the elites backed him. Things are never quite what they seem. The myth, the worst, most vulgar myth is that there is a spontaneous, heroic, leftist rebellion against an oligarchy that uses the army to defend their ill-gotten gains. It's a monstrous distortion. It never existed. So, most I could really do here, I want to talk about a few specific places my favorite people. My, my favorite of all, I think, is General Velasco of, of Peru. Um, the point is to suggest that the assumptions and prejudices of almost every single journalist and academic in English are wrong and deliberately wrong. The, the point isn't so much getting deep into policy detail, but showing that military rulers have generally been very rational, determined, successful, very sensitive, and populist and that they were thrust into the limelight during times of extreme stress. 
and their policies were far superior than the banana republics that they replaced. Um, no one murders for no reason. Right? I mean, even Pol Pot thought he was cleansing the country of social disease. No one sees himself as a bad guy. Right? The historian's job, and I have to explain this to you like there are three. The historian's job isn't to pompously lecture the dead on their sins, but rather to understand these guys in context. What did they think that they were doing? And the funny thing is, you know, if anyone could be accused of brutality as a matter of policy, it's exactly those that the Anglo-American establishment wants to defend, the Trotskys and the Mounds. It's the left, not the right, that makes brutality a matter of not only state policy, but philosophical principle. The implication here is that democratically elected leaders down there in Latin America would have done far worse than these military men did. Democracy's humiliating failures are exactly what caused these coups. The same thing, Europe in the 1930s, um, Cold War in South America, uh, the 60s in uh, East Asia, in the 40s, the 60s in East Asia. The pattern seems to be the same. A legislature, so-called democratically elected, comes to be made of politicians who, in order to be elected, are dependent on big money to function. It creates very comp- compromised elites, and a very profoundly divided legislature that, as a result, can't forcefully deal with national crises. These democracies in the third world are paralyzed in the face of extreme violence, terrorism from all sides, consensus breakdown, and worst of all, the dominance of foreign money that uses their own weaknesses against them. And this is why we call them banana republics. It's an insulting pejorative term, and they've earned it. No third world success, and by success I mean a third world country that's become a first world country, or is well on their way, have occurred under liberalism. Every success story has occurred under some form of national socialism and authoritarianism. Of those states that have clawed their way from poverty, every one accomplished this under a military or another authoritarian government. Parks Korea, today's Iran, there's Germany, Putin's Russia, Chang's Taiwan, Singapore. They're the best known examples, but there are many others. If these militaries were still in power, it would be a far different situation in Latin America. It would be a far better and well-developed and more rational society. Banana republics are installed by the U.S. because it's easy for capital to penetrate those countries and boss them around. Military governments did most of the nationalization of property in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It was the military who did this. These are nationalists. These are national socialists. They nationalized most strategic industries. They could do this because they weren't elected. That's the whole point. If they were elected, they owed people money. Well, let's talk about Nicaragua. Just, I mean, and I'm doing this in no particular order. I vaguely remember, in the early 80s, the Contras fighting the Marxist Sandinista government of, of Danny Ortega was one of the big foreign policy, if not the big foreign policy issue at the time. Now, the assumption was that Nastasia Somoza, who died in 1980, killed in 1980, was an evil man because he was a military dictator. He ruled twice, from 67 to 72, and from 1974 to 79. Like most of these guys, he was a wise and very popular ruler who was far better for the country than any alternative. And I want to I take a minute to mention that this was my very, very first, when I started college, my first big issue. I think I've mentioned this before. Uh, I think when I was talking about Indonesia and Korea, South Korea. This is my first big issue. Military, authoritarian governments are better economically in every other way than liberal democracies. And one of the reasons that I was promoted by my professors is not that they agreed with me, but because I was really good at it. And I beat them in debate. That never happened before. So either they just hated me because they were were arrogant, or they said, wait a minute, 
this guy's pretty good. So this has been a concern of mine since I was 18 years old, believe it or not. So Somoza um, was a very good man. His primary concern was, as all national socialists want, to bring labor into national politics without Marxist violence. It's a common theme. The left hates these guys not because they're threatened militarily by them, but because these guys always steal their issues. The U.S. didn't support him, not in, in the least, because he refused all foreign loans. He said no foreign loans, only local sources of funding. The belief that he was supported by Washington is a fantasy. He was overthrown by Washington working with the Sandinistas. Now, the Cuban presence later on changed that with Reagan, but up until Reagan, the U.S. was pro-Sandinista. The oligarchs were quite real, but they didn't like or trust him. And he said that these oligarchs keep peasants ignorant. Now, there's a false quote that allegedly Somoza said, I don't want an educated population, I want oxen. He didn't say it. He said this is what the communists want. And it just so happens, if you've seen the movie The Killing Fields about Pol Pot, that's exactly what Pol Pot says. The main character says, um, Ankar, or the party, wants the peasants to be like the ox and have no thought except for the party. That's where that comes from. He never said it. Another myth about him is that he sold blood, literally blood, of his population to blood banks in the U.S. One moron even said this. Every morning, the homeless, drunks, and poor people went to sell their half liter of blood for 35 Nicaraguan Cordobas. Small amount of money. Well, no one bothered to tell this moron that drunks can't donate blood. Most of these homeless people were on drugs. They, they couldn't possibly donate blood. It's made up. Maybe the family had stock in businesses like this, but it's not inherently an evil field. And there were regular, there were two elections under his rule. He was elected both in 1967 and 1974, and the Organization of American States oversaw these elections and dubbed them free and fair. At no point, and this is the case almost everywhere, no opposition newspapers were shut down. Although, when the Marxists come to power, they shut down all um, non-state newspapers. They're doing it in America. Any uh, any um, nationalist paper is, is, is brought to court and people thrown in prison. Now, why a dictator who wants people like Oxen, why he would maintain newspapers and have elections is a bit of a mystery. But he was a syndicalist and a corporatist, like all national socialists are. He saw foreign industry as a great evil, as a blight on the country. But like all of these military men, he wanted the peasantry to own the land that they worked. Under his first administration, Somoza said, and this is very common, that any land that could be farmed by anyone was theirs for the taking. It was the farming, the work that you did on the land that gave you title to it. So he banned absentee landlords. He offered cheap credit because he was refusing foreign loans, and he vehemently condemned usury, which is one of the perennial reasons the peasantry remained in debt and that the left never talked about. At the time, he was considered socialist by the U.S. You know, the, the State Department and the Defense Department, these aren't really smart guys. I mean, in, in terms of, you know, they're, they're devious people. They're not really policy specialists. They have a very limited ideological vocabulary. Anyone who's not F.A. Hayek is a socialist. Uh, but the State Department Office for Latin America backed the Sandinistas for many years against Somoza. Um, but Somoza wrote a book called Nicaragua Betrayed, which is definitely worth reading. He talks about communist death squads all the time, which, of course, the press never talked about. Um, as in almost every Latin American and East Asian country, they went after local mayors, clergy, and, and uh, city councilmen. It was plain terrorism, and they killed them. Uh, a major source of funding for the Leninists, and this is well known in Latin America, in Central America at least, was kidnapping children from prominent families and holding them for ransom. Uh, I mentioned this uh, with El Salvador. President uh, Duarte had his daughter uh, captured. 
by the heroic of MLN and help for ransom. But Somoza said, you know, I could have destroyed the Communist Party right away, but they were willing to work with me on land reform. Well, they don't believe in private property, and they don't believe that peasantry should own the land, so maybe this is an exaggeration, or he was just naive. In 1976-1977, any aid to Somoza's army was stopped. The ambassador to the U.S. began talks with the Sandinistas. Robert Pastor, uh, Carter's representative, asked the president of Costa Rica, "When are we going to get rid of the son of a bitch of the north out of the presidency of the north out of the president? Meaning north of Costa Rica or Nicaragua? When are we going to get rid of them?" State Department was given proof that Sandinistas come from the Cuban and the Soviet Union. They refused it. The IMF was told to refuse any credit to the country despite solid economic performance. The U.S. pressured banks to go elsewhere. Now, unfortunately, uh, he ended up having to borrow abroad. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But this is what drove him to say, you know, we can have our own. And when he built a, a whole bunch of uh, hydroelectric dams in the countryside, uh, a state expense, he used only local um, sources of funding. And then the U.S. banned all co- coffee exports from the country, as well as beef, which is essentially the economy. So they were going to destroy the economy of Nicaragua with unseat Somoza. So if you talk about you know Reagan aiding the Contras, that's certainly true. But the same American government, the, the administration before him, was pouring money to the Sandinistas and doing everything they could to destroy the economy so that Danny Ortega and the Sandinista movement could take over. The first thing the Sandinistas did when they took over is execute about 3,000 right-wing politicians, mostly local mayors. Then the Carter administration gave special privileges for the USSR to use seaports close to Latin America to trade with the new government. And, of course, weapons were in this cargo. Somoza talks about the Human Rights Commission, which he invited into his country. He invited Fidel Castro to do the same. Of course, he declined. Now, the Human Rights Commission, you know, these are all NGOs that are financed by the big banks and foundations. But they assured Somoza this is a neutral committee. We're going to be objective about all of this. Essentially what Somoza says is that their methodology that any pro-government or pro-Somoza uh, politician or writer or poet or anything like that was rejected. They only wanted to hear those who had something to say against the government. Um, what they found out, of course, was a lot of people supported Somoza and because the communists made themselves so unpopular with the kidnappings and, and, and massacres. Um, but the commission, as, as Somoza said, turned a deaf ear to this. They wouldn't even listen. They wouldn't even report it. This is a human rights commission, and they won't report when the left does something wrong. But it's nothing new. Well, what were they going to do? I mean, when would an establishment academic come out and say, oh, military government's okay. They did better than, than, uh, than the left. How can they say that? If an academic says that, he'll be targeted immediately as an apologist for brutal dictators, their job would be in danger, and subject to physical violence, as I was. But the commission was significant. Corrupt or not, their report led the U.S. and Europe to condemn Somoza and to cut off all trade and assistance. The Sandinistas especially in what they did to young army officers like uh, Juan Ocon. They tortured this guy. Uh, they chopped off his head, and his family couldn't find his head, so they, bur- they had to bury the body with, with a plaster head attached to it. Uh, uh, Alvaro Sanchez was taken out of his home and shot in the presence of his children. Uh, Espinoza, uh, Pedro Espinoza, a newspaper man, a member of the Liberal Party, was captured by the Sandinistas in El Dorado. He was tortured, his eyes gouged out, and then he was shot. In Leon, the second largest city, 13 members of the uh, National Guard, which is Somoza's force, surrendered to the Sandinistas. They were then immediately taken to the football stadium, where they were all shot. It's not like the American press were ignorant of these kind of things. Um, Rafael Saavedra, who was the director of customs under Somoza, uh, 
was burned alive by the Sandinistas and two sons killed. Two female police students were captured. One was four months pregnant. They tortured her to death. Um, this is according to sworn testimony given to the U.S. House of Representatives, which appears in the congressional record of February 26, 1980. And the group was under the command of an American by the name of Clifford Scott. Uh, Major uh, Bingo Guterres, six of his men were captured. They were placed in a hole, sprayed with gasoline, and burned alive. I could go on and on and on about this. It's, there's nothing new. This is what they did with POWs. Uh, Smoza did not do the same for POWs at all. These were not called the worker death squads. They were not reported at all. The person covering the war for the New York Times, a guy named Alan Ryden, told Smoza to his face that he was both a socialist and that he, through his reporting, was going to bring down his government. And yet it was Somoza accused of shutting down the free press, which, of course, he never did. At no time did the U.S. support this man. He threw the bankers out of his country. He banned usury. That's not going to make you popular in Washington. But let's talk about something here. The, the concept of support. You'll hear this all the time. You, you do a Google search, it'll come up all the time. The U.S. supported these dictators, back to these dictators, some, some word like that. They rarely define what they mean. If you trade with a country, Trading with the country doesn't mean the trading partners are political allies. And governments don't do that anyway. Private-seeking industries do that. The U.S. traded nonstop at the USSR from 1918 to 1990. When a journalist says the U.S. supported brutal dictators, he really means that the trade remained the way it was. In other words, support is anything um, more than or anything, anything short of, of harsh sanctions and a land invasion. But near the end of his reign, the only country willing to sell weapons to Samoa was Israel. Israel, of all places. But even when the Reagan administration was supporting the Contras, he did so while condemning Samoa in the harshest terms. Reagan saw the Contras as representing uh, Jamal's group or the liberal, liberal, uh, more or less liberal group, as alternative to the communists. Well, I mentioned that he banned foreign loans, but then, unfortunately, he had to borrow. Why is that? Because in 1972, a massive earthquake tore through the country. This is the reason that he had to maintain power longer than he, um, than he meant to. And so many of his land reforms didn't materialize because as he's beginning this, it tore the capital city, Managua, into pieces. Strangely enough, there were no gigantic rock concerts like Live Aid in 1985 to assist the country after the earthquake. Isn't that weird? But Live Aid itself was meant to send food aid to communist Ethiopia under uh, Mengistu Halimaram. Um, and so many of his, um, uh, Samosa's progress was destroyed. But by 1974, the GDP grew almost 14%. Now listen, listen to how this, the CIA country, um, description for his era. Listen to how they put, it. now, he, Samosa spent a fortune Reconstructing the country after the earthquake. 14% GDP growth in one year, a lot of it because of the construction. They say this. It's merely a reflection of high world prices for coffee and cotton. In other words, economic success was an accident. It's nothing to do with him. It grew so much because coffee prices were high. Well, if the mere possession of a high demand resource led to growth, why aren't all the diamond rich African states First world countries today. Chad has oil. Why isn't it a dominant power? Or Somalia, for that matter. Well, growth in Nicaragua from 1961 to 1980 is far greater than its liberal era from 1990 to today. Even when, without taking the earthquake into consideration. 
Growth capital formation soared under Somoza. He ran a trade surplus. External debt was non-existent. And yet, from 1980 to 1994, so you have both um, Sandinistas and liberals, the debt went from zero to 1,200% of GDP. At no point was there any substantial land reform in the country except under Somoza. Well, the earthquake killed about 10,000 people. 90% of Managua's housing was unstable. So the, the government had to run deficits and things like that. And he tries to rebuild the country, and even there, even there, they say this, listen, the government increased expenses to finance rebuilding, which primarily benefited the construction industry in which the Somoza family had a strong financial interest. My God. The man can't win. If he refuses to assist, he's a monster. If he does assist, he's a monster. If he gets a dollar to charity, it's just to make him liked by others, make him popular. If he doesn't, he's greedy. But this kind of, you know, when did you stop beating your wife kind of issue is the opposite of what journalism is supposed to be. The quake is what forced him to borrow from abroad. The city of Lyon is the second largest city in the country and is the financial hub of the country. Um, the banking uh, clans there were on the left of the political spectrum like bankers usually are and they backed the Reds and um, allegedly after the Sandinistas took over the U.S. then took over the banking sector because you know what guerrillas don't usually make good bankers we're told that the U.S. had sanctions against the Sandinistas but, you know, when you hear this, whether it be about Cuba or Nicaragua, read the actual law itself. Read what it is that's being banned here. In the Nicaraguan case, it's really only a few agricultural products. But in terms of Lyon and the banking clans, they were anti Somoza and anti-Contra, to be honest with you. But the civil war there was sparked by Cuba. And the minute the war began, the accidental economic growth ground to a halt. And it came to a halt despite coffee prices remaining very high. Under the Sandinistas, economic growth was non-existent. Inflation went through the roof. Debt went very high, as we mentioned. And only about 10% of capital was nationalized. The military government in El Salvador nationalized far more than that by 1984. I remember the debates over the Contras in the 80s. And of course, all the assumptions about Somoza were wrong. American conservatives would fall all over each other, trying to argue that the Contras were not formally part of his army. In 1980, he was assassinated in exile. And Castro took credit for this. Um, Somoza was one of the organizers of the Bay of Pigs. And Castro always had a particular hatred for him. Um for this reason. Now, let me let me just just as this, let me give you an example of how these people operate here. If you look at the Wikipedia page on Somoza, it says that in 1979 the Brazilian newspaper Gazeta Mercantil estimated that the Somoza family fortune amounted to between 2 billion and 4 billion dollars. Now, they're saying that this is from a Brazilian newspaper, but look at the footnote. The footnote brings you to the World Marxist Review Volume 22. This kind of deception is normal for these people. But the figure of 2 billion is cited all the time. There's no reason to believe it. How could they know this? If it came from the communists, then it should be doubted. Uh, why didn't they ask about uh, Daniel Ortega's fortune? What did they do? Did they break into to, to the palace and, and, and steal his ledgers? If he were so wealthy... Why didn't he uh, hire more mercenaries? How was the man assassinated with such ease? Wouldn't he have his own substantial militia? Well, I don't really know the answer to this, but of course I wasn't a journalist in the 1980s. But these questions were never even asked, let alone answered. Now, I don't know if I'm going to get through it all, but I want to start now with my favorite 
military uh, 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 ruler, National Socialist uh, General Juan Velasco in Peru. Um, very much like in Russia in the 90s, the president of Peru at the time was uh, Fernando Belaunde. This is in uh, the late 60s, early 70s. And Belaunde was going to give Peru's oil fields to American investors. This is why um, the military quite vehemently intervened in politics. The army took these fields over and nationalized the oil industry. General Velasco was one of the most articulate and successful nationalist military leaders in history, let alone in Latin America, which is why you've probably never heard of him. Um, his government was from 1968 to 1975. But again, the background of these guys is important. He overthrew Fernando Balaunde. Velasco himself was a shoeshine boy when he was a kid. His parents had 11 children that lived in poverty. But Balaunde came from one of the most elite families in the country. His father served as a finance minister to President Jose Bustamante. And he ended his career as one of the judges at the International Court at The Hague. The whole family educated in the U.S. And you see this pattern over and over again. The military men who overthrow these guys really enjoy themselves. The, the poverty-stricken military general who worked his way up the ladder overthrew the man who was given everything on a silver platter. And, of course, it's going to be reflected in their policies. Velasco, uh, the junta, was three generals, was called the Revolutionary Government of the Armed Forces. Uh, and uh, Peruanissimo was the name of the ideology that he developed, uh, and it is clear uh, social nationalism. And it was really directed at the poorest of Peru. He wanted to create a strong national industry and create an independent Peru, not just politically, but also economically. He nationalized entire industries. He expropriated entire corporations owned by American investors, from fisheries to mining, to telecommunications, to power production. And he created the conglomerate, uh, the, the, like the South Korean Chaebol model. Uh, it was Pesca Peru, Mineral Peru, Petro Peru, Cider Peru, Electro Peru. And this is not uncommon. Velasco was one of the more decisive of these guys, but he nationalized billions of dollars in American investments down there. You mean to tell me that the U.S. supported him? He wanted to discourage foreigners from investing here. He wanted to keep the con economy under state control and out of, the out of the reach of Western capital. If he didn't do this, all the major industries of the country would have been bought up and run by Americans or Englishmen or whoever. But it's not remarkable because all coups in Latin America had this as a goal. Now, it's so similar to General Park in South Korea that there has to be a connection there. It's the same period of time. Um, the Chaebol system clearly uh, was insanely successful in South Korea. And I'm pretty sure Velasco was trying to imitate that. But clearly, even hostile sources say the quality of life in Peru quickly improved. Um, you know, remember something, and this is important to note. Conservatism, traditionalism, nationalism, all pretty much one and the same thing. None of us are capitalists. Only in America are conservatives associated with, with capitalism. You should really call them libertarians. The right, in the most broad sense, is syndicalist, corporatist, and Hegelian. We accept limited private property. But nowhere except in America is the unlimited right to private property uh, a right-wing position. But only in the U.S. during the Cold War, conservatism had some connection with libertarianism, and it became associated with capitalism and the free market and stuff like that. Only in America. The rest of the world, it was a kind of a form of some form of, of social nationalism. Um. But it was more than this. 
We talked about the Greek military government. It's all really the same thing. These men poured a fortune into education, into health care. For the first time in 1972, his education reform actually provided for bilingual instruction for the Indian population. It was about half the population in the 1970s. You know, um, this isn't exactly the, the stereotype of the right-wing military government, but that's what they do. Peru and Isimo is a long-term planning system. Liberal systems are not big on planning. They, they exist for short-term profits. The rotation of politicians makes long-term planning almost impossible, and really what it does at a minimum is it encourages the creation of a professional bureaucracy uh, and is really impervious to any, sh- any, any short-term changes in political control. So this bureaucracy exists no matter who is elected. But Velasco didn't shut down the newspaper. He did found state newspaper to compete with the local newspapers often owned by foreigners. Um, he had a strong agrarian reform program. He expropriated large landowners like all the military dictators did. Anywhere they go, they all expropriated the large landowners. Um, for his first 10 years in power, the revolutionary government expropriated 15,000 plots, uh, totaling almost 30 million acres, and benefited about 300,000 families. And of course, journalists and academics were dead silent. They were compensated by the government, but they, the old, land, old landowners complained that it was too little. They were, they were paid in agrarian reform bonds. But as a civil war financed by uh, foreign sources, the drug problem continued to grow. Inflation increased. See, Peru has a problem. It has the lowest amount of arable land in South America. Only about 2%. It's really good land there. There's a lot of desert there. There's a lot of harsh mountains. You need a strong state to maintain any kind of functional agrarian economy there. As always, liberal democracy had failed miserably. And politicians were dependent on wealthy and often foreign donors. Um, he, uh, with the land redistribution and oil nationalization were his big, big issues. He also built the steel and iron industry, which became big parts of the economy under his control. They were also in state hands. But the minute he limits elite land ownership, he's called a communist by the State Department. He created something called an industrial community. These were profit-sharing associations, relatively unique to Peru. Labor became institutionally a part of management, ownership, and profits. No matter what else, 15% of all pre-tax income went to local needs. Labor was guaranteed a full 50% ownership and all state and private bodies of any size. And he reduced the country's reliance on foreign investment and foreign loan. By, um, by, by, the, by the time he left, mid-70s, only 17% of the capital in the country was owned by foreigners. He broke the power of the oligarchs by recreating the court system. He broke the court. In fact, he, he destroyed the old court system, which was controlled by the old elite. Now, we're all told in college and in the newspapers that these military governments serve the oligarchs. This is what the oligarchs did to protect their investments from the communists. Well, General Velasco and most of these other guys smashed the oligarchy and smashed the communists. He created a new... Um, style of courts. They're called courts of the land. No judge was allowed to own any land or any amount of capital. So, as well as the industrial community, he also founded the agricultural cooperatives. Usury was banned, and the court system was internal to them. He did what the left just promised. By 1975, almost 70% of all land was in the hands of the peasantry. And yet, for some weird reason, it coincided with a massive intensification of leftist agitation in the countryside. Isn't that weird? Well, I don't have time to talk about Laurie Berenson, 
we all know the Shining Path uh, Maoist organization and the so-called uh, MRTA, which is a Leninist organization. Ori Berenson is a Jewish activist from Long Island who ended up being one of the leaders of the Marxists in Peru. And let me repeat that so you can get it. A Jewish professor from Long Island ended up being one of the leaders of the MRTA in Peru. Well, turns out she's Mossad. Um, because when they captured her, what she was trying to do was uh, she and a bunch of others were going to storm the legislature and take them all hostage. Uh, not too long, about uh, December 96, they stormed the Japanese uh, embassy and they took 72 hostages. I think one hostage died. During her trial, the judge had to wear hoods because they'd be targets of the of the communists. She began in her Yiddish accent, screaming in court, there are no criminal terrorists in the MRTA. It's a revolutionary movement. In other words, she's screaming her guilt in the classroom. Now, her parents, now I don't know why her parents matter here, but they, they were, they're, of course, clearly Mossad in New York, said, well, on her way to court, she passed a cell where cops were torturing some guy, and so she was hysterical. That's why she yelled that. Now, now, no one knows how, A, why were her parents relevant to anything? B, how they could possibly know this? And C, how she even got a trial? Look, when a terrorist is on trial in a country, do his parents usually get to weigh in on the matter? Well, like in so many other places, these terrorist cells rendered the justice system nearly on the verge of collapse. Now, of course, I'm talking in the 90s. This is long after Velasco. But judges, once the military was gone, could barely function. Anyone who tried to convict a terrorist was hounded and murdered. Witnesses were also killed. Uh, you couldn't find witnesses and you couldn't find judges. But somehow, American lawyers, I don't know how American lawyers have jurisdiction in Peru, but they do. So again, Berenson ain't no ordinary terrorist. It's pure Mossad. He's claiming that she didn't get a fair trial because they were wearing hoods. Well, most of Peru wants to see her killed. They want her gone. But you know what they did with her? They sent her to Israel. Now, how often do you hear about a government in a civil war sending a terrorist leader in exile to Israel? She's never been to Israel, by the way. Um, the massacres done by the Maoist Shining Path. Um, Peru is, is somewhat unique because thanks to Velasco's military government, the communists were very unpopular. And when the communists are unpopular, they just start slaughtering people. Um, the local peasant militias were called rondas. And here you have just real, you know, more or less local communal self-organization. You know, they all had guns. And, and uh, they killed um, Kurtome, one of the, um, or Lagro Kurtome, um, in 1985, uh, uh, no, I think it was 1983, and they killed him. The massacre at a place I can't pronounce, they massacred 69 peasants in retaliation, 18 of whom were under 12. They did it again in Marcus in August of 1985. In Haulo, uh, they killed 47 peasants, 17 of whom were under 15. See, because the military government, the National Socialist military government, stole all the issues that the communists claimed to have, the Shining Path had very little to say. They did what these communists said they were going to do. The Shining Path also doesn't wear uniforms. So anytime you hear someone saying that the military um, had, uh, you know, abused his authority against the Shining Path, by definition it can't. According to international law, any guerrilla organization has to be in uniform or have some kind of identifying mark that can be seen from a distance. 
If a civilian is killed in the mistaken belief that he's a terrorist, then it's the Shining Path that's responsible, not the army. And wherever the Shining Path controls an area, they force, they call it conscription, they force young men into the army, their own army. And the reason it's like this is because General Velasco uh, and the, the legacy of the military rule in Peru was so positive, so powerful, that the peasantry couldn't have been any more pro, uh, pro-national pro socialist. So Shining Path and the MRTA, whatever it is, uh, ends up having to set off bombs in Market Square. For some reason, the MRTA, maybe this is... Um, Maybe this is that Jew's idea. Whenever they're going to attack a, a, a village, they kill a bunch of dogs and cats and they hang them from lampposts. That's their calling card. It's like they're, they're serial killers. They, they have to leave some kind of a mark. But because of General Velasco, Peruvians hate these people. You know, and the reason that, that Peru can never fall for, for, uh, these scumbags is that General Velasco is one of the greatest leaders in Latin American history. And that's why you've never heard of them. All right, we're going to stop here because I'm over an hour. But we'll have part two next week. And um, hopefully I'll get through it all. I have a few other places to go to. The point of all of this is to show, of course, that these military governments were extremely well-organized, rational, and extremely successful. That's the point of all this. They're not just brutal, killing random people for no reason. They're soldiers. They don't want to be politicians, but they have to be. Anyway, I'll continue this with Colombia next week. I thank you uh, for your support, and I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.